Hey guys, welcome to the first episode of our web series, Horror Needs a Hero. Thanks for watching. So as you guys all know, we lost uh, a few horror icons over the past year. We lost Betsy Palmer, we lost Christopher Lee, and then we lost Wes Craven just recently. So CP and I, we wanted to make this first episode kind of special, just to kind of honor the past and what these icons brought to the horror table. Now I'm going to touch on Betsy Palmer and Christopher Lee. Not to take anything away from them, but uh, I'm going to close off my chapter with some detail on Wes Craven and I'm going to talk about Last House on the Left and why that movie was such a groundbreaker in the current horror landscape. And I'm also going to share a personal story uh, from The Hills Have Eyes Part 2. But first let's kick it off with Betsy Palmer. Betsy Palmer was such an unlikely choice to be a quote-unquote horror icon. As we all know, she played Pamela Voorhees in Friday the 13th, and even she did not see herself in this role. As a matter of fact, she took the role because she wanted to get a new car. And her agent called her up and he said, hey, I got a script for you. And she was like, I don't care, I'll take anything I can get. He was like, well, hold on just a sec. Just so you know, this is a horror film. And Betsy Palmer did not like the idea of doing a low budget horror film or horror in general. Before Friday the 13th, she was more of a squeaky clean, girl next door, 40s and 50s type actress. Kind of like a Sally Field. So this is something that was a risk for her and it could really tarnish her career, but luckily she was getting up there in age and she felt like she didn't have anything to lose. She didn't think Friday the 13th was gonna do anything. She thought it would be just a small little movie that came and went and nobody would see it. Because we all know, for every successful horror movie, there are at least 20 unsuccessful horror movies that nobody ever sees. And also, when she read the script for Friday the 13th, she thought, this is a piece of crap. And I'm paraphrasing, but it's somewhere in that ballpark. But as we all know, she ended up doing Friday the 13th, the movie was a huge success, and she became a legendary horror icon. And ironically, I think she is the reason why the first movie was such a success because A, it was such a surprise, and a spoiler alert here, guys, it was such a surprise that she turned out to be the killer in the movie. We don't see her until the end. And she played the character in almost a squeaky clean way. I was, I was actually recently watching an interview with her and she stated how she wanted to play the character like she was doing something that was right. She didn't feel like an evil person. She was protecting her son. And because she played it so straight-laced like that, it, in the end, made her character creepier. And I've seen a lot of footage from horror conventions with Betsy Palmer, and she seems like she is the sweetest lady. She always greets the fans with open arms. It's not something that she puts down. She knows that Friday the 13th really elevated her career, and it got her that car. So next we're going to move on to Christopher Lee. We all know Christopher Lee is an icon. It doesn't even need to be said. The guy did somewhere between 250 to 300 movies in his lifetime, which is an impeccable resume. Most of them horror. Here's a guy, just by flipping through his resume, you know he loved the horror genre. He really treated it with respect. And one story that I always like to tell when somebody brings up Christopher Lee in a conversation was, did you know that Christopher Lee was one of the first choices to play Dr. Loomis in Halloween. A lot of people don't know that. When John Carpenter went to him, he turned it down. Years after, uh, he was interviewed and Christopher Lee stated that that was the one movie that he had the biggest regret of turning down was John Carpenter's Halloween. And I always thought, wouldn't it be interesting uh, to see that movie, to see Christopher Lee actually play Dr. Loomis? I think he would have an interesting take on the character. Now. I'm not taking anything away from Donald Pleasance. He played Dr. Loomis exactly the way I would want that character to be played. And I even think that Christopher Lee would have played him quite differently, but I still probably would have enjoyed it. But I'm a huge fan of Christopher Lee. I am a huge Lord of the Rings fan. Christopher Lee himself is a huge Lord of the Rings fan, having read all the books every year, pretty much since the books came out. When he would be on the set of Lord of the Rings, Everybody would go to him for questions. Why did this happen over here? And what was this character's motivation? And Christopher Lee could answer every single question. The guy loved Lord of the Rings that much. He loved Tolkien that much. 
And when I heard that he died, oh my, it just really floored me because I love his portrayal of Saruman. He played that character so great. He played it in a way where, yeah, he, he was evil, but you kind of saw where he was coming from. He gave Saruman weight. And finally, I have to talk about Wes Craven. Wes Craven is one of the biggest horror directors to come out in the last 30 to 40 years. I already did an in-depth review of A Nightmare on Elm Street. So I'm not really gonna focus on Nightmare on Elm Street and Scream. I, I, and I talked about Scream in the first Horror Needs a Hero video, which we never thought that this was gonna be a web series, but we had so much fun with it, so here we are doing a web series. What I wanna talk about is Wes Craven's first movie, Last House on the Left, and maybe talk a little bit about Wes Craven's beginnings. Wes Craven was actually from a very religious family. He came from a Baptist upbringing, and it was so strict that he couldn't even watch movies until he left home. So he was, in a sense, really repressed. And it was from that repression that Wes Craven made Last House on the Left. And I actually watched Last House on the Left today and I watched an interview with Wes Craven and just to kind of get an update on what his mind frame was when he made such a controversial film. Even today, if you watch Last House on the Left, it is very hard to watch. And to take it even further, I would say Last House on the Left is really the first torture porn film. What's interesting is Wes Craven actually wrote it to kind of step outside of his squeaky clean image. He wanted to be the bad person. He said he had never actually been a bad person before and he wanted to make a movie and to almost feel dirty about it, you know, to feel disgusted with himself and that's why he made the movie because that is really art sometimes art is about stepping outside of yourself and giving your own interpretation of what you see something as and sometimes that something is not a good thing it could be murder it could be evil it could be whatever and i think to be a really effective director especially a horror director you're gonna have to step outside of that safe zone if you will Wes Craven, his very first movie, that's what he did. He said, I want to do something that is almost shocking and controversial. And he said it didn't really hit home until the movie was finished and he actually watched it for the first time. That's when he actually felt dirty because he was so busy making the movie that he didn't really even think about that. And if you don't know, Last House on the Left is basically about this kind of well-to-do family and they have these uh, th these two girls, uh, one of them's their daughter and the other one is the daughter's friend and they're, you know, really squeaky clean. And then these murderers, it's kind of a murderer's family. If you watch Rob Zombie's Devil's Rejects, that family kind of reminds me of this family. That family really kind of owes a huge debt to the family in Last House on the Left. One of the characters' names is Krug. Wes Craven actually named Freddy Krueger, kind of borrowing from the name Krug. And so basically in the movie, this evil family pretty much tortures these two young girls. And this is pre I Spit on Your Grave. And I remember watching I Spit on Your Grave when I was young, and that is a really hard movie to watch. And I never at that time knew about Last House on the Left. And I would say that movie actually borrowed a lot from Last House on the Left, maybe taking it a step further even. When Last House on the Left was released in theaters, this was one of those immediate negative reactions. There were people walking out of the theater. There were people vomiting in the theater and there were people even actually trying to get up in the projection booth to take the reel off and destroy it. That's how out of hand it got. And for a long time, Wes Craven was looked down upon because of that. Now, people look up to him because he was willing to take these types of risks. He was willing to say, hey, art is not always gonna be safe. Art is not always gonna be roses and petals. These are real issues that happen and we have to sometimes look at these real issues in the face. He even talks about if you look back in like Greek mythology, there were atrocities that happened every day. In the 20th century, people were just kind of ignoring that fact. Uh, they didn't want that on the silver screen. They wanted material that was more entertaining and didn't make you feel uncomfortable. Now we have movies like that. Uh, it, it is mainstream horror now. We have Saw, we have Hostel. Now we have The Green Inferno that's coming out. All these movies owe a massive debt to Last House on the Left. 
And finally, just to share a small little story with you, uh, I remember I had never saw The Hills Have Eyes, the original uh, directed by Wes Craven. I did see The Hills Have Eyes part two, sort of. This was 1986, I believe. I think I was like 12, 13 years old. And my sister was going out on a date with her boyfriend and we went to a drive-in movie theater. And they snuck me in the trunk of this car and then we drove on and I remember we did a double feature and the double feature was The Hills Have Eyes Part 2 and Psycho 3. And I can't really give you a review for The Hills Have Eyes Part 2 because I don't remember any of it. I remember Psycho 3 played first and I remembered everything about that but maybe I was just too tired by the time they showed it, The Hills Have Eyes Part 2 but I did a little research on that movie. It was interesting to note that that movie actually was filmed before A Nightmare on Elm Street and it was only two-thirds filmed. They had to pretty much quit production because they ran out of money. Nine on Elm Street comes out, was a huge success, so then Wes Craven is asked to go back and release that movie, but he didn't have a finished product, so what they did was they took some parts from The Hills of Eyes Part 1 and just padded that movie. Ever since that movie came out, Wes Craven always disowned it. He said, I will not support this movie because it wasn't a finished product by him. So anyway guys, that is the drum dumps portion for this webisode for Horror Needs a Hero. And I thank you so much guys for supporting us and watching uh, CP and I give our thoughts on horror. We want to hear your thoughts on Betsy Palmer, Christopher Lee, Wes Craven. Love to hear your own personal thoughts and stories. Guys, thanks for watching and drum dumb out.